Good morning. I always count it a joy to come this way on Sunday morning to worship with you and to share with one another the goodness of God in our life. I'd like to share with you this morning a subject that I have entitled The Myth the myth of Palm Sunday. Now, if you are a listener to Christian radio or you watch Christian TV, you're going to hear a preacher this week say something like this. On Palm Sunday, when Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem, the same people who cried out Hosanna within a week would be the same people who would cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Well, let's find out if that's so. There's hardly a Christmas or an Easter season that comes by that you do not hear somebody say those words. But let's see if it's true, if God's word tells us that the same people who cried out Hosanna, king of the highest, were the same ones who cried out crucify him, crucify him, some days later. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can open your word with freedom and share with one another the goodness of God. We are grateful, Lord, that you love us with an everlasting love and that you promised you would never leave us, you'd never forsake us. You said, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. We cling to that promise, Lord, and to the many others that we can claim within the pages of your word. As we near the Easter season and we think of the time that you came into this world, born as a babe in Bethlehem, but yet destined to die upon a cross just outside of the city of Jerusalem. We thank you, Lord, that you paid a price for our sins, which we could not pay on our own. And so today, as we look into your word, might we understand exactly what happened during that week, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. If you have your Bibles and you'd like to follow along, uh, let's turn to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 19 and beginning with verse 28. After Jesus had said this, said what? He taught his disciples another parable. It was a parable about the ten minus. And following the time of his teaching, we're told after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. Now when the Jewish people traveled to Jerusalem, They would not pass through Samaria, but they would go down into the Jordan Valley. And they would walk through the city of Jericho. And then at Jericho, they would turn toward the the, uh, west. And they would go up to the city of Jerusalem. They would be traveling from 1,200 feet below sea level to 2,500 feet above sea level. And it's uphill all the way. And so Jesus made his way to the city of Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go. Now right on the top of the mountain of of, um, the Mount of Olives, 
was a little city during Jesus' time, which was known as Bethpage. Now today, if you were to go up to the top of the Mount of Olives, and you would walk over to where Bethpage once existed, all that you would see is an archway. And above that archway, carved into the stone, is the word Bethpage. That's all that exists today of the city of Bethpage. But just about a half a mile from Bethpage, down the slopes of the Mount of Olives, the other way toward the Sea of uh, a, a Dead Sea, there you will find the city of Bethany. And that's normally where Jesus stayed when he came to Jerusalem. It was just about a mile and a half, two miles from the city of Jerusalem. So Jesus could stay at Bethany and then go into the city of Jerusalem and that he could minister there. So he got to the city of Bethpage and he said to two of his disciples, go into the city ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever sat upon. Take it, bring it to me. If anyone asks you, why are you untying the colt? Tell them, the Lord has need of it. Now, rather Jesus made prior arrangements with the owner of this colt, uh, that when the day come, he would need it. We're not sure how it happened. But there was no resistance to the owner of this colt in allowing Jesus to take it and to be led out by his disciples, and he sat upon this colt. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as the Lord had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked him, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the cold and put Jesus on it and he went along and people spread their cloaks on the road and when he came near the place where the road leads down from the Mount of Olives the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all of the miracles that they had seen so here is Jesus riding upon this colt coming down over the Mount of Olives and coming toward the city of Jerusalem. Now it was time for the Passover. So pilgrims from all over the territory had come to the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the Passover, which was the number one, the major feast that was celebrated by the Jewish people back in Jesus' day and even celebrated by Jewish people today. Celebrating the feast of the Passover is an important part of Jewish worship. And so as Jesus rode down over the Mount of Olives toward the city of Jerusalem, he rode into what is known as the Kidron Valley, which is between the Mount of Olives and the city of Jerusalem. Now, during the Passover season, thousands of Jewish people would come and pitch tents in the Kidron Valley, and it is there that they would wait for the time of the celebration of the Passover. There was not room in the city of Jerusalem to accommodate all of the pilgrims as they traveled to the city. Many of them stayed in the city, but most of them stayed outside of the city in the Kidron Valley, which is on the eastern side of the city of Jerusalem. And we're told that when he came near the place where the road goes down uh, from the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God with loud voices for all of the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, a quote from the Old Testament. 
peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Again, a quote from the Old Testament. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Now the Pharisees did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. As a matter of fact, they had made plans on numerous occasions to arrest him and even put him to death prior to this event. And so they couldn't figure out what all the commotion was. So they came out of the city, sort of mingled in among the disciples of Jesus so that they could find out what was happening. And so they said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. So this tells us who were the people that were there at the time of Palm Sunday when Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem. They were Jesus' disciples. The Pharisees, Jesus, rebuke your disciples. They are saying things that we do not believe. They are quoting from the Old Testament as if to say that you are the Messiah, that you are the King of the Jews. And we know that that's impossible. That can't be. We're looking for a Messiah who will come and deliver us from the reign of the Roman Empire. And Jesus does not fit that description. So please tell your disciples to be quiet and not to continue to say what they say. And Jesus says, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as Jesus approached the city of Jerusalem, we're told that he wept over the city. Jesus wept when he realized that those who he had come to be their Messiah, to be their Redeemer, refused to accept him. And so Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. Now, if we turn over just a few pages in the Gospel of Luke to Luke chapter 22, we read these words beginning at verse 47. While he, that is Jesus, was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. So here was Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, a place where Jesus found solitude, a quiet place to pray and a quiet place to meditate and connect with his Father in heaven. Jesus often went to the beautiful Garden of Gethsemane. Now, I was there just recently, and uh, it is a beautiful place. There are olive trees there. One of them that they claim was still there when Jesus lived, and he spent time in the Garden of Gethsemane. These trees are a thousand or 2,000 years old. You used to be able to walk through the Garden of Gethsemane, but now they've placed a fence around it so you can walk around it, but you can't walk through it. Because what was happening, the tourists were breaking branches off of the trees in the Garden of Gethsemane and taking them as souvenirs. So they closed up the Garden of Gethsemane so you can't walk through it anymore, but you can walk around it. And you can view those olive trees that are there in the midst of the Garden of Gethsemane. And so Jesus was speaking to his disciples when a crowd approached him, being led, we're told, by Judas. One of the twelve, he was leading them and he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, 
Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? I can only imagine the, 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 the pangs of guilt that maybe was felt by Judas on this occasion when Jesus asked him that question, have you come to betray me? And when Jesus' followers saw what was going on, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? Now, in biblical times, people carried swords. Even Jesus' disciples carried swords. On one occasion, he said that he did not approve of that. Nevertheless, for their own safety, they carried swords. So when Jesus' followers saw what was going on, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Now the scripture says that, that it was Peter who, with his sword, cut off the right ear of the servant of the high priest. Now, we don't know if the ear was completely detached and maybe fell to the ground or if it was just hanging there by a little bit of flesh. But whatever, Jesus either reached down on the ground and picked up the ear and put it back in place or the ear that was barely hanging there we're told that Jesus touched his ear and that he healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and the officials of the temple guard and the elders who had come for him, am I leading a rebellion? Do you think I'm a rebellious person? Am I a traitor to our nation? Why have you come for me? Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Now, how do we know it was dark when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus? Well, this incident is recorded in all four of the Gospels, but only in the Gospel of John, in chapter 18, do we read these words. So Judas came to the grove guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials, the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. So John tells us that it was after dark when the guard came to arrest Jesus being led by one of the 12, that is Jesus follower, Judas, who was betraying him. Back to Luke chapter 22. Verse 34, we read these words. Then seizing him, that is, the soldiers seized Jesus, and they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest, and Peter followed afar off. So we're told here that the soldiers arrested Jesus. They led him away from the Garden of Gethsemane. They led him down into the Kidron Valley, and up the southern side of the city of Jerusalem to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, it was dark. The disciples who had cried out to Jesus that he is Hosanna, king in the highest, they were asleep. Darkness had come, and the disciples were with Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus was arrested and led away to the house of Caius the high priest. Now the house of Caius the high priest still stands today, and you can visit 
the house of Caiaphas. And down in the dungeon beneath the house of Caiaphas, there is a stone dungeon where Jesus was placed that night. And he spent the night in that dungeon beneath the house of Caiaphas. He was questioned by the religious leaders. They tried to get him to claim that he was not the Messiah, but Jesus did not recant his position. In Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 59 or 69, we read these words. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together. Now they met at daybreak, as soon as the sun began to arise. And Jesus was led before them and they said, if you are the Christ, tell us. And Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I ask you, you would not answer. But from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the Father, the Almighty God. So it was at daybreak that Jesus was brought before the high priests, the elders, and the leading people of the city of Jerusalem. And they questioned him. Following their time of questioning, they scourged him with whips, and then they took him to Pilate to be judged by Pilate. There in the city of Jerusalem, Jesus stood before Pilate and was condemned to die. Now we know that Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. Even Pilate's wife said, don't have anything to do with this situation because I had a dream last night and he is a just man and he is not worthy to be condemned, especially to be condemned to death. But nevertheless, because of the crying of the people there in the city of Jerusalem, saying, crucify him, crucify him, Jesus was led out to the place called the place of the skull. And there he was crucified on a hillside just outside of the city of Jerusalem. Therefore, when we read about Jesus on Palm Sunday, being worshipped by his disciples as he rode down the Roman road from the Mount of Olives to the city of Jerusalem, we know that it was a different crowd of people that cried out, Hosanna, King, Lord in the highest, a different group of people than the group of people that would cry out in the city the following morning, crucify him, crucify him. And so Jesus that morning was led out of the city of Jerusalem to a hillside called Calvary, and there he was crucified. There are two groups of people. One group of people honored Jesus as the Messiah. Those were the pilgrims that were camped outside of the city of Jerusalem in the Kidron Valley, along with Jesus' followers and his disciples. And when Jesus appeared, riding down over the Mount of Olives, they were the ones who cried out, Hosanna. But the following morning when Jesus was in the city of Jerusalem, standing before the judgment of the Jewish people and Pilate himself, 
it was a different crowd that cried out, crucify him, crucify him. As far as God is concerned, there are two groups of people in this world. Only two groups of people. There are those who follow the Lord Jesus Christ and know him as Lord and Savior of their life. And then there are the others who refuse to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of these days we're told that there will be a division made. There will be a division made between those who know the Lord and those who refuse to recognize the Lord Jesus Christ. That division has always existed. Since the very beginning of time, that division has always existed. Even back during the time of Noah, there was Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives who were saved in the ark. Everyone else perished because they refused to recognize the Lord. And down through the history of the Old Testament, we find that there are always a division between people who recognize God and who refuse to recognize the God of heaven. And so when we come to this place, we also see the division between two groups of people. Those who recognize Jesus as Lord and Savior and those who refuse to recognize him and cry out, crucify him, crucify him. So during the course of this week, as you listen to Christian radio or you watch Christian television, remember when a preacher says to you, the same people who cried out Hosanna when Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem are the same people who several days later cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Not so. If they would search the scriptures, if they would understand how the two groups of people came about, they would know and they would understand that the statement that they are making is not true. And even in today's world, there are those who receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, and there are those who refuse to accept him as their Lord and their Savior. One of these days, Jesus said, those people are going to stand before me, and I will be the judge, and I will send my followers, my believers, into the presence of Almighty God in heaven. But those who refuse to accept me as Savior and Lord will be banished to a place of darkness, a place called hell, a place of torment. And so today, as we think about Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, we say to ourselves, where do I stand before the Lord Jesus Christ? Am I in the group that has received him as Savior and Lord of my life? Have I recognized the fact that I am a sinner and that without the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in my heart, I will be lost for eternity? Or are those among us today who know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord And when the time comes, Jesus redeems us unto himself and calls us into his presence to live with him forever and forever in eternity paradise. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the clarity of your word. And there are some times, Lord, that we hear people say things that are not biblically correct. And that's the reason, Lord, that we need to search the scriptures. 
We need to come and to know and to understand the fact, Lord, that you speak to our heart through these words in this book. Help us to know and to understand your plan for us, your plan for those who have been redeemed, your eternal plan when you call us unto yourself. We remember today, Lord, the price that you paid for our sins. And as we bow our heads and our hearts in prayer, we ask you once again, forgive us, Lord, of our sins. Help us to commit our hearts and lives unto you. Might we know within our hearts that we indeed are a child of God and that one day we will be with you in your presence forever and forever. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.